a suspect, as Leatherman was a suspect in a narcotics raid. Also, special damages must be stated. Now, what are special damages? You should know this. They are pecuniary compensation, or rather, it is pecuniary compensation for injuries that follow the initial injury. So they're injuries that happen, or rather, it's compensation for the injuries that happen post-injury. Now, the rules to focus on. We're going to go back to Rule 7. What's a pleading? Well, a pleading is a complaint, answer, and a reply, only if necessary. Um, the complaints may include counter and cross complaints, and a reply is only necessary if the court orders one. doesn't mean you can't do it, but um, you're not compelled to do it unless the co court says so. Rule number eight, uh, the general rules of pleadings, 8A, you must have a short and plain statement with jurisdiction affirmatively pled. Uh, you must also have a short statement of the claim showing the pleader is entitled to relief, and you must have a demand for relief. This is the wherefore statement, uh, as we call it sometimes, and it is also sometimes referred to as the prayer. Wherefore, um, we demand this or that, or wherefore the judge should do this or that, or we pray the judge does this or that, etc. You get the point. Um, Rule 12b-6, the motion for failure to state a claim. You should know this one by now. And it's filed if the pleader fails to provide a short statement of claim showing relief entitlement. Um, and uh, finally, Rule 9. In certain kinds of lawsuits, particular lawsuits, you need to do more to survive a 12b-6. Heightened pleading is required when the case alleges fraud or mistake. The parties must state the allegations with particularity. They must state them, I mean clearly, with particularity. Fair note here that the court cannot create a suit not explicitly allowed per Rule 9. It's according to Judge Rehnquist in the Leatherman case. It must be a case alleging fraud or mistake, nothing else. Rule 9 is limited to cases of fraud or mistake. Heightened pleading, keep that in mind. Always associate heightened pleading with Rule 9 and always associate it with its restrictions. Now, I'll do plausible pleading. Yes. We're getting more narrow. Plausible pleading. Essentially, in 2007, the Supreme Court of the United States seemed to end the Conley v. Gibson reign. In Conley, you only needed the possibility to state a claim for relief. In Twombly, a case we haven't discussed, but we will in other podcasts, because it's an important case, it's fair to note here, in Twombly, the plausibility to state a claim for relief uh, is what's needed, and the court was interested in protecting antitrust defendants. So you'd think that kind of narrows it even further to simply, or to plausible pleading even further, um, a requirement rather, to simply uh, antitrust defendants, but that's not really the case as you'll discover here in a moment. So from Conley to Twombly, Conley is the possibility to state a claim for relief, and Twombly narrows that. It says it must be plausible a higher standard than simply possible. Then along came Iqbal. In Iqbal, when a complaint does not allow the court to infer more than a possibility, then the complaint has alleged but not shown the pleader is entitled to relief. Brings us to the Twickball test, as my professor calls it. Uh, Twombly Iqbal. Um, the test is twofold. Just ask yourself, are the allegations well pleaded? Uh, in other words, they must be more than conclusory. Um, and are the well pleaded allegations plausible? Does it entitle relief? It is context specific. Um, again, are the allegations well pleaded? Think back to the well pleaded complaint rule. And are the well pleaded allegations plausible? Requiring context here. Uh, Twitball um, is supposed to be a corrective measure for the costly discovery process. That is, uh, under Twitball, a court can nip a case in the bud before it gets to discovery if it's not well pleaded, if the, if the, if the plea is not well pleaded, essentially. <laughs> Keep in mind, I'm a law student as well, so I'm a. Uh, um, doing my best to understand this stuff just as much as the next law student. Um, now, returning to the federal rules. Uh, the, the federal rules 
standard in that the defendant is entitled to notice of a logically coherent theory of liability, um, a gateway to Rule 8 discovery. So uh, with Twigball, um, yeah, some argue that it's uh, actually a return to this, that this doesn't change the rule. It kind of wrangles in the, 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 the case law um, that's expanded over, over the years and sort of um, brought it all back to uh, you know, the entitlement um, of a logically coherent theory of liability. That is, your complaint must be, or rather your pleading, must be uh, logically co coherent. So, um, yeah, Ronnie would um, probably fail under that standard. Now, <laughs> that does it for pleading. So quickly, in summary, um, surviving the 12b-6, think of DeWardy, Connolly, and Doe v. Smith. Um, you can go back and just reread those cases, um, revise them, revisit, re-whatever. Just check them out, see how they survived. Um, and, and, and also, start, you know, it'll begin to help, help, help you formulate, uh, you know, an understanding of how the pleadings rules have, you know, not only changed by jurisdiction, but have, ex have uh, you know, narrow, expanded, narrowed, and then finally kind of gone back to what they're supposed to be. Um, rule three, we did not discuss, but it's uh, fair to note here that rule three, uh, under rule three, a civil action commences when the complaint is filed. Um, rule 8D, a plaintiff may include contradictory allegations, as you've heard. Um, it's okay because the facts have not been revealed yet, and the pleadings are about providing notice. <clears throat> if you remember the, the reasons for pleadings, it's essentially to provide more ample notice to, um, you know, to a defendant that they're being sued and they better do something or face, um, you know, a default judgment. <laughs> Um, rule 10, allegations should be in separate counts and uh, some other template instructions, rev uh, revisit that. Um, and also remember there's no such thing as a Rule 10 dismissal. Back to Rule 8, under Rule 8E, pleadings must be construed so as to do justice. Again, that also means no Rule 10 dismissals. Plausible is a higher standard than possible. Plausible is a higher standard than possible. Facts can help move facts from conceivable and possible and possible to plausible. That is, facts can help move facts from simply being conceivable and possible to outright plausible, which would meet the plausible pleading standard. Legal conclusions are not entitled to assumption of truth. This is under Twombly. So you remember that uh, allegations there's a reason why we call them that is because it's not necessarily the truth. They're just assumed to be the truth by the judge. Therefore, they are allegations. Um, and only a motion that contains plausible claim for relief survives under Twombly and Iqbal standard. It doesn't mean that it's not going to survive under other standards. It just means typically if you're looking at the Twombly and Iqbal standard, which is what, we, what, um, what sort of controls these days, especially when a, when a jurisdiction needs to uh, be persuaded, Twombly Iqbal, only a motion that contains a plausible claim for relief can survive. Now, quickly, I've only got a few minutes left. We're going to talk about um, what to do, you know, when you get served. You just got served, right? What do you do? You can ignore the complaint, you can defend it, you can answer the complaint. So, ignoring the complaint, uh, you know, you can do that because the rules do not force a defendant to respond affirmatively in any way to a complaint at all. You don't have to respond. You're not compelled to do so, essentially. Um, maybe your conscience will compel you because the consequences are that a sequence of steps uh, driven by the non-defaulting party uh, can lead to a default judgment, which, we, which means you will have to pay or have to not do or do something uh, and never get your um, constitutional day in court. <laughs> Rule 55 authorizes default judgments um, if the non-defaulting party and the court carefully follow the prescribed procedures. Um, so um, another thing you can do when getting served is you can defend it. You can file to dismiss for a number of things. You can file to dismiss for lack of subject matter jurisdiction, lack of personal jurisdiction, improper venue, insufficient process, failure to join a required party, failure to state a claim, 12b-6, your favorite one. 
Uh, another thing you can do, uh, another option is to simply answer the complaint. Um, and answering the complaint, you know, we'll get into that later. Um, there, you can, there, there are a number of things you can do, put it that way. But right now I'm going to concentrate quickly on doing nothing, which is the default option if you go to Virgin Records v. Lacey. This is a case uh, dealing with motion for summary judgment. Essentially, Lacey, Lacey was sued by uh, Virgin Records America for downloading copyrighted content. Uh, she allegedly did this. The complaint requested statutory damages, attorney fees, and an injunction which uh, prohibited Lacey from further infringing um, on the copyrights uh, or to destroy all the copies of the downloaded content. Um, Virgin followed the prescribed procedures. Um, Follow return of service reflecting that the that Lacey had been served with process by a private process server. Now the copies of the summons and the complaint were left with the defendant's dwelling or or usual place of abode, as they call it, um, and it was uh, received by her son. Um, three months went by, never filed an answer, never appeared in the action. There was a motion filed for the clerk's entry of default, and it was entered against Lacey for failure to plead or otherwise defend. A copy of the default was mailed to the address. Again, didn't do nothing. 30 more days passed, so the plaintiff uh, sought entry of default judgment. Um, now, typically, these two things are done together. Well, generally, they're at least attempted to be filed together, but in this case, it wasn't. There was a little bit of uh, playroom so to speak, between the, um, the entry of default judgment and, or not the entry, but the, the request for default judgment and the entry for default, default judgment. Um, actually, those two are the same things. Forget what I just said about that. The entry for default judgment is totally different. Um, I confused myself in the, uh, in the, you know, reading too much into the mailing. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so Rule 55 provides for entry of default um, and default judgment where a defendant has uh, failed to plead or otherwise defend, as provided by the rules in Rule 55, where a party offers no good reason for the late filing of its entry, an entry of default judgment against the party is appropriate. Now, remember that the complaint and summons must be com uh, included in service of process. Without those, um, the defendant has, you know, has some grounds to dismiss. But if the uh, defendant fails to even mention that or to or, or motions for it in pre-answer to 12b-6, um, then they're essentially going to waive their right to do so uh, upon upon uh, further action. Unless that's a good excuse. Um, now the judge may still deny a default judgment if the, if the complaint itself fails to include A, a cause of action, and B, an action which entitles plaintiff to relief. Now, we've already discussed the levels of that, the levels that must be met. Uh, but those are the two things that a judge is going to consider. The cause of action, uh, if absent, or, um, or an action which entitles plaintiff to relief. If absent from the complaint, a judge can just throw it out. Um, and a defendant must answer within 20 to 21 days. Um, there are some exceptions to this. Uh, the 21 day rule um, under 12a, under timing. Um, the exceptions are if you waive, you get extra time, you get 60 days instead of 21 if you waive. Uh, another exception is you following an answer shifts if defendant files a pre answer motion. So file that 12b6. Then you get 14 days after the court denied its motion, in which more time is granted by default because it takes them a while to figure out if a 12b6 is appropriate. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got through this. That does it for me for this first episode of The Law Student Civil, Civil Procedure Following a Federal Claim. I hope this helped you out. Remember, always uh, defer to your own notes. This is simply uh, another medium to just kind of help people out. It also helps myself out so I can go back and listen to this uh, when I get tired of reading and when my eyes pop out. Anyhow, this is James. Keep listening, and remember, every day is good for civil procedure or something like that. I don't know. My brain's fried right now. I'll talk to you guys later. All right.